Hello, everyone. My name is Suha Soyla, and I'm the Director of Operations at Hosokal Micron Powder Systems. We at Hosokal Micron Powder Systems welcome you and thank you for attending the second installment in a two-part series of educational webinars entitled The Basics of Isolation Technology. Let me point out, if you have any questions during the presentation, you may submit your question online at any time. Please refer to the Q&A pane on the right side of your screen. At the conclusion of the webinar, we will try to accommodate all of the questions during our question and answer form. Additionally, I would like to let everyone know that we will be sending out a short survey after this presentation. Responders will be entered into a drawing for a $50 American Express gift card. Hoskow Micron Powder Systems is a division of Hoskow Micron Group with headquarters in Osaka, Japan. We are the global leader in powder processing equipment with over 1,500 employees worldwide, production facilities in five countries, and 12 research facilities and state-of-the-art test centers. Hosokawa well, Micron Powder Systems, founded in 1923 under the name of Pulverizing Machinery, is responsible for the North American market. We, from Summit, New Jersey office, provide sales, engineering, manufacturing, and aftermarket services for the food, pharmaceutical, chemical, and minerals industries. We are proud to be the inventors of the micropulverizer, hammer and screen mill, as well as the most versatile air classifying mills. Our brand names include Micro, Alpine, Reconada, Majac, Micron, Stott, and Vitalair. So what is containment? Um, you know what, uh, one of the things I want to say is that as this is the second part in the series, the few slides at the very beginning are a repetition of the uh, earlier presentation, but I thought it was relevant for individuals that have not participated in that one. And if you want more detail, obviously you can always go and watch the earlier presentation. Containment is the separation of product from the operator or the environment. Now, again, just like the last time around, we are going to come to, and, and containment could be in, in a couple of ways, one of them protecting the operator, the other one protecting the uh, product, and the third could be protecting both. Um, in this case, you know, a sterile um, um, isolator and a potent sterile isolator. We're primarily going to concentrate on protecting the operator and negative, uh, negative pressure isolators. Again, just looking at some of the common terminology associated with containment, the primary one that uh, we should talk about is OEL, which stands for Occupational Exposure Level. And um, there are some additional terms like uh, PEL, MAC, STEL, standing for like short-term exposure levels, uh, MEL for maximum exposure limits. But again, the, the, the two critical ones are the OEL and maybe the uh, peak exposure or the ceiling uh, exposure level. Um, associated with the product. Now, um, the exposure levels can be tied into exposure bands to, to kind of narrow and associate certain solutions to these uh, levels. And here you can see the listing of it. Primarily, you know, the industry is trying to standardize on these bands, and they're broken out into almost like one-tenth fractions, as you can see. Um, OEB, operator exposure band of 5, is less than 1 microgram. The next one up is 1 to 10, and the next one up is 10 to 100. So it's going in multiples of 10. So, you know what, additionally, um, you are seeing currently with people looking for nanogram containment levels, you are seeing people talking about an OEB 6, which would fall to the right of the, the, the last one here. And that refers to, then qualifies the OEB 5 as 1 microgram to 100 nanograms and OED6 being less than 100 nanograms level to give a little bit of a separation. And as we're talking about, you know, uh, OEL levels and whatnot with the numbers that I'm throwing out, just again to reiterate, um, one grain of salt uh, is typically 50 micrograms. So when we're talking exposure levels, as you can see here, which is talked about in micrograms per cubic meter over an eight-hour typical shift, time-weighted average, you know, if somebody says um, you're, you're looking at 10 micrograms, uh, OEL of 10 micrograms per cubic meter, then they're talking about, you know, an amount one-fifth of a, a grain of salt or grain of sugar over an eight-hour period, a shift, a full shift, which gives you an indication of 
how small particle we're talking about. Um, this slide is going to repetition, just showing containment strategy. And I just modified the example here slightly so that, you know, we can go through this one more time. And you can see that if, if I had a scenario where the, the batch size that I was dealing with was 5 kilograms, and if I was going to process this in 40 minutes, and the dust potential of my product was high, meaning it's a light density, a very fine product, that means it could be potentially very uh, dusty. Um, if I follow this chart, the quantity handled, 5 kilograms being less than 10 kilograms falls into the small range, so I'm in this quadrant here. Going further in, which is looking for a test length, and I'm at 40 minutes, and this is defined as less than 30 minutes is a short and over 30 minutes is long. So since I'm at 40, I'm in a long term here. And then the dust potential being high puts me into a exposure potential of an E3. Now, I can take this value and we can move on to our next slide. And some additional information required from the customer or the process side, which is the OEL level. In this case, it's an OEL 5. I'm sorry, OEL of 5 micrograms per cubic meter. And then the exposure potential that we calculated from the last slide, which was an E3, uh, we now combine these. Uh, as I mentioned in my earlier slide, that 5 micrograms co corresponds to OED uh, operating exposure band of 4. So combining that with uh, exposure potential E3 puts us in a, a strategy of S4. And this slide here shows us what those strategies are. And in this case, an S4 is a closed handling with an isolator, basically. So again, a quick reference to, uh, you know, this is not obviously uh, written in stone. This gives you a quick reference to what type of a technology you're looking for. And then a detailed analysis can be further conducted to uh, come up with the ultimate solution. Now, when we're talking containment, um, specifically in the pharmaceutical industry where validation is part of this or will be a part of this issue, um, a URS, a user requirement spec, is extremely critical. Um, you know, this is, first of all, the start of all validation documentation, but even if validation was not an issue, uh, this is the best means of conveying your requirements uh, to, to your vendor and making sure that, you know, all, the, all, the, all your requirements are listed so that there's no misunderstanding and that there's no design flaws as you move forward, since this is a fairly expensive and a timely process. A couple of areas to be looked at in the user requirements spec, obviously, starting with the OEL level, and that could be the process OEL level, as well as the cleaning OEL level, and which I'll touch up on late as, as we go through the slides. The second area to concentrate and identify is your batch size, you know, what type of uh, size of material you're handling, um, you know, whether it's going to be coming in bags, is it going to be coming in IBCs. Particle size distribution, again, defines the... Uh, uh, dust potential, uh, if it's too fine, too light, and also the explosivity of the product, which typically is uh, defined by its KST value, as well as the Pmax and um, MIE, minimum ignition energy, um, which, again, will help us identify some of the, um, you know, designs that we need to build into the isolator system. Additionally, we would look at operational environmental issues, uh, starting with uh, electrical area classification, whether, you know, where the, the isolator in the process has to be in a Division One, Division Two non-hazardous area, uh, what the process gas is going to be, and, and this is if you're talking about, say, an internal process inside of an isolator, like a, a, a milling process, um, there is an internal gas going inside of that, as well as there is gas in, inside of the isolator. So, both of these could be either air or they could be nitrogen or other gases. And, you know, use of nitrogen inside of uh, the isolator as well as the process gases uh, primarily used as a, a, a medium for inerting the environment to prevent explosion hazard. But also, you know, if your material is uh, sensitive to uh, water, like hydroscopic material, or if it's sensitive to uh, oxygen that can change color, you know, nitrogen, again, could provide a good solution to prevent those uh, problems. Additionally, you know, level of automation and controls need to be identified up front so that, uh, again, a proper system can be provided. And, and controls could be fairly detailed, um, you know, starting with relay with push buttons, where if you have an extremely simple isolator, a relay push button might work, and the advantage of this is extremely easy to validate. 
But for the most part, when the system starts getting complicated with additional process equipment inside of it, you know, PLC systems obviously become more uh, logical. And with a PLC system, you can have those, a PLC com combination with a push button, OIT, or OIT with some graphics. Now, if your demand on graphics uh, is a little bit higher, you can replace your OIT with a SCADA package. And additionally, if you're looking to do uh, electronic records and electronic signatures, you can take the, um, you know, extend the SCADA package to comply with CFR 21 Part 11. Um, additionally, um, cleaning needs to be thought of in while preparing the user requirement specifications. And again, I think this is one of the issues that most people tend to neglect and would hurt them the most. Uh, cleaning is is one of the most important. It is as much as important as the process itself in identifying how the cleaning is going to be done, what kind of solutions or solvents are going to be used up front so that this does not become a surprise and a major problem or a headache at the tail end of the project. And finally, physical limitations associated with the room that the unit is going to go in should be looked at. You know, considering uh, isolators are fairly large units, you know, if you have uh, a freight elevator or a specific door that needs to go through, obviously those, those need to be identified up front so that the design is done to allow for this unit to be moved into its final operational location. With that, I'm going to start talking about different types of isolators, and I'll start it by flexible isolation. As you can see in the photos here, you know, if you have a very large process and you want to contain it, uh, it's going to be very difficult to do it with any other means than just putting plastic bags around it and, you know, zippered accesses or velcroed accesses. Now, depending upon the way you set this up, you know, you can achieve um, even down to one microgram level containment, as you can see here. Um, a stainless frame with a polyethylene bag stretched across it has been provided for uh, processing um, uh, some material. And as you can see on the side, there is a transfer port, um, as you can point, I'm pointing out here, a transfer port is provided, as well as a negative pressure. There's a suction through a HEPA filter to provide negative pressure inside of the, the chamber here, which will allow you to get down to one microgram levels. Um, a variation of this concept could be um, a compact, flex, flexible compact isolator. And the purpose of this is to, if you have small laboratory equipment, uh, we do offer um, a fixed size stainless tubs that, that get closed over with uh, either a polyethylene uh, cover or a solid acrylic cover that provides for uh, multi multiple uh, lab size equipment to be placed inside and provide you with containment for your smaller pieces of operations. As you can see on the back side, there's enough room for a 190 millimeter RPT, and this can be provided with negative pressure with ports for on both sides, uh, here and here, to provide HEPA filtration in and out uh, to provide, again, a negative pressure inside. Um, additionally, this unit has this uh, inflatable seal so that when the cover is closed on it, it can inflate and, and seal properly uh, to give you high levels of containment. And um, this slide here shows a small laboratory scale uh, universal pin melt inside of the unit. In this case, our customer wanted to do, uh, they had inert material that they wanted to run, uh, and it was a potent compound, so we placed, uh, placed it inside of our small SCI and uh, inerted the environment and we were able to run a, um, a test inside. Here you can see a two-inch uh, spiral jet mill, again, inside the same unit with its own dedicated feeder. Now, one step up from this is uh, a, what's called a half-suit isolator, where you're, you're kind of getting the benefits of uh, wearing a PPE with um, minimizing, I guess, the risk of using a PPE to, to a certain degree. The advantages of this type of a design is that it gives you a little better access inside of the isolator. You know, you're talking typically um, reach of about a, maybe a 1.2 meter or let's say three to three and a half feet of reach inside of an isolator. And you're talking about, you know, a carrying capacity or lifting capacity of maybe up to 15 kilograms of objects when you're using a, a half suit style isolator. You know, the downside of it is, as you can see here, the half suit is one size, and if you have different proportioned operators, 
you know, they're going to have some difficulty if a smaller person, uh, if this is designed for a larger person, a smaller person using it is going to have a little bit more difficulty. Plus, you know, the additional um, limitations of a PP also apply here. Um, and then the next level up from that is the basic uh, rigid wall isolator. And here you can see some of the, the primary components associated with it. Uh, most of these units uh, will have some sort of a door that could be opened up uh, once the unit is clean to access the internals of it or to place things inside of it. Uh, you obviously need glove ports that are shown, although I say door here, they're actually glove ports. Um, the processing equipment would be inside, feeders, mills, uh, dust collection chamber, CIP nozzles for cleaning, uh, HEPA filters, and controls. And typically what we'll do is we'll also create a, um, a technical area which would be separated from the, the process zone where all the mechanical drive components are placed. And this is the same way that you're looking at it from the back side, where you're seeing this metal stainless plate that isolates or separates the process zone from the mechanical zone or the technical space. And here you can see the double HEPA filters that are used for exhausting the gas, the isolator fan here, the process fan there, um, instrumentation associated with moving nitrogen and air uh, to the proper locations, control panel again on the side of it integrated to the unit. So again, the, the purpose of this is to make sure that um, anything that does not have to be in a process zone is isolated to make cleaning much easier. Typically, isolators are designed in um, uh, three phases, the first phase being the uh, 3D modeling phase. And what we try to do is once we have an order in a house, we would start with a 3D model of the, of the concept that we have, which will be reviewed with the customer. Uh, and, and, and with the capabilities of 3D and moving things around, you know, you have a better visualization of what, what is taking place with the model that's being proposed. And additionally, it provides a, a better transition to manufacturing drawings and whatnot, speeding up the downstream processes in terms of the production side as well. After the, uh, you know, we agree on the model with our customer that, that you know, this model kind of covers the requirements of the URS, we would go into the mock-up stage where we would do a, a wooden mock-up uh, of the 3D model that was shown in real life size and place as much of the uh, equipment, real equipment, if we can't find real equipment, we would put uh, wooden mock-ups of those, trying to even simulate the weight of them, inside of the isolator so that, you know, you can kind of have your operators come and play with this unit to determine whether our blood ports are in the right places. As you can see, these are on tracks here so that, you know, during mock-up we can move them around and determine the best possible location. Um, you know, if you have an, a, a connection port for bringing in material, you can put that in and try transferring material to see how easily the access is, whether the glove port size is proper, you know, gives you proper handling. But, again, just to give you an idea, um, you know, handling-wise, uh, we talked with the half suit isolators, 15 kilograms. When you're going to rigid wall isolators with, you know, arms going through blood ports, you're talking maybe about five kilograms of material handling um, um, and, and maybe like 600 millimeters of reach that would get you to a touch and really working distance of 450 millimeters, maybe like a foot and a half uh, or so or a little over two, maybe close to two feet. Um, again, during, during this uh, mock-up review, uh, we strongly recommend that the cleaning pr procedure that, you know, you have outlined in your URS is also followed through to see how that would work out, dismantling equipment inside. Is it easy to get inside of these equipment? And, and you know, even moving the spray gun around if you need to wash something down or wet something down during the process to see how this is going to all work out. And obviously, once that's done, we move into production and get to the final phase, which is the finished machine. Now, I, you, you guys heard me talk about the uh, negative pressure isolator, so before we go any further, I kind of want to um, talk about this a little bit. Here you can see a basic chamber, isolation chamber, and your process, whatever it is, is inside of it with certain glove ports and transfer areas. And what we're do typically doing is keeping, maintaining a minus 100 to minus 160 pascals of negative pressure inside. That's about... 0.4 inches to 0.6 inches of negative pressure inside. 
And what, what we're doing is we're monitoring with a pressure transmitter, monitoring the uh, pressure inside this chamber and controlling the fan speed to make sure that we maintain this pressure. The reason for this is obviously, as I mentioned earlier, I'm concentrating on operator protection. If there is a leak anywhere along the boundaries of this uh, isolation uh, device, that the leak would be inwards. If, if it's inside is negative, obviously the flow of air is going to be from the environment into, into inside to the isolator, which obviously protects the um, operator from any material coming out and getting um, exposing the operator to it. Um, additionally, what we what we do watch out for is that whatever openings we provide, we make sure that the unit is capable of drawing at least uh, 0.45 meters per second velocity through the biggest opening, which is called the breach mode. So in case of, um, let's say, you have a, a complete um, a glove that drops into the isolator, you have that opening of the glove port, you want to make sure that you can maintain uh, with your current fan a flow through that opening or a velocity through that opening of 0.45 meters per second so that, again, there is a high velocity going in that would prevent any product coming out. And, and what that's going to do is, again, when you drop that out, the timber is going to start moving tro towards atmospheric conditions. The transmitter sensing that is going to start speeding the fan up until you get to, to the breach mode. With that, um, I would like to move on to talking about some of the internal components that can be associated with um, isolators. And um, I'm going to start with feeders uh, for dry powder. Um, and, and just to let you know, the reason I'm talking about these components is that, you know, again, anything that you use outside of an isolator, even if you're a pharmaceutical in, in a pharmaceutical environment, um, you, you definitely need special designs to go inside of an isolator. Um, here, what, what's, what's basically, tried, you know, the, the, I guess the aim here is to make sure that we have smooth surfaces, cleanable so that no dust or particles can be uh, uh, left on surfaces that it would allow potential exposure to the operators once the unit is cleaned and then the front cover open. So. What you want to make sure is, as you can see here with this vibratory um, uh, feeder here, all the mechanics are enclosed inside of a smooth stainless enclosure with a Teflon base to it, so that when you wash it down, it, it can be cleaned 100%, and there is no powder residue left over that could jeopardize the exposure uh, to, your, to your operators. Here you can see a slightly different twin screw uh, feeder, again, specifically designed for an isolator, and um, you can see that these units can be, just, you know, provided as a gravimetric of feeders, but the critical thing here that I'm trying to show is that um, this feeder is modular in design, so that it comes apart very easily, again, to be cleaned inside of an isolator fairly easily, and each component is also attached to the back plate with these hinge arms. Again, that's going back to the, the weight limit that I mentioned, that operators will have very limited uh, lifting capability. We said five kilograms. So this bowl here, which is made out of a solid chunk of stainless steel, you certainly don't want that, uh, your operator trying to handle that through a glove port. So this is attached to the back plate. All the operator needs to do is just slide it away and move it off to the side to clean it. Um, the next item I'll talk about is basically uh, the heart of uh, you know, maintaining exposure limits is the RTP or rapid transfer port, or sometimes referred to as DPTE. Uh, it's a French-based word. Um, and, and, and the reason this is so critical is uh, once you have your material uh, within the isolator, you know, your containment is pretty much guaranteed. Where you run into the biggest problems is where the material is actually crossing the boundary of the isolator where you're bringing your material into your isolator of a process zone or in where you're taking it out. And RTPs basically is one of the best means of allowing us to do that with the highest levels of uh, containment. Um, La Callahan or Getting It is one of the primary vendors that provide this type of a technology as well as uh, CRL, uh, Central Research Labs. And, um, you know, uh, they're very, very similar in concept, and what they work off is a, a, an alpha-beta uh, sections that work in, in conjunction with one another. So in essence, what we're talking about is the alpha port gets mounted onto the isolator wall, 
the beta section is on top of the, you know, the um, container cover. Once the, these are attached together, as can be seen here, and it's the, they're provided with a twist lock mechanism, once it's locked into place, it will allow you to open the door from within the isolator, and that kind of, the inner part is the alpha part, the outer part is the beta part, that opens the uh, inside of the container to the inside of the isolator. And when it, within a contained manner, you can transfer items that are inside of this drum that you attach to the side wall of your isolator to, to your process area. And after wiping it down, you can close the container cover and, and, and remove the container away from your isolator while maintaining nanogram containment levels. A similar process is, uh, can be done with test boxes or airlocks. Now, these are more suitable um, for larger objects. And maybe going back to uh, rapid transfer ports, you know, the typical sizes are from about 100 millimeters to about 350 millimeters. So when you're looking to move in large containers inside of, a, uh, of an isolator, as you can see here on this left-hand photo, you can move a, a big drum inside of this chamber from opening up an outside door, moving it in. Once the chamber is closed, then you can open an inside door, and these are interlocked, uh, and then move the particles in further in. Now, the downside of this technology is once you open the inner door to this chamber, this chamber is contaminated. So unless you do cleaning here, you will not be able to open up the outside door again, unlike a, a, an RTP7. So there are some advantages maybe, but there are some disadvantages as well compared to uh, uh, rapid transfer ports. Here, um, you know, we can see um, split butterfly valves, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, works again off a similar alpha-beta principle. Um, the uh, alpha or the active part being mounted onto the isolator, the beta or the passive half being mounted onto the container or your IBC or your, your, your bottle, basically. And once they're docked, then the valve could be opened up for flow of product through it. But, uh, you know, for them to be, again, to separate them, the valve needs to be closed. And once they're, they're split apart, you have this contained surface on both sides of it. And with these, this type of a technology, again, you can go down to nanogram containment levels. Uh, there's multiple vendors that provide this type of technology from, you know, GLAD to Buck to um, uh, Vima to um, um, ChargePoint. So there's numerous technologies, and, you know, it's basically a customer choice in terms of um, primarily whatever technology they have at their facility with the passive elements. That's probably when they're going to make a decision on, you know, what type of uh, vendor or what vendor's product they would want to use. Additionally, um, you know, somewhat of a, a less expensive solution is a hyperflex, and with this you can get down to maybe one microgram containment level. And here we're talking about plastic bags that have a, a almost like a Ziploc mechanism on them. Uh, when they're docked with their mating part uh, inside of the mechanism here that, that is provided, uh, whether it's manually or automatically, they could be pushed in together and, as you could see here, uh, provide an opening where material transfer can take place. Now, downside of this technology is uh, that it's not meant to be used over and over again uh, without, you know, unlike the split butterfly valves and, you know, too many uses might jeopardize the, uh, the containment levels that these do provide. Additionally, even maybe simpler way of providing containment is continuous liners, and this is becoming more and more uh, prevalent um, since now it used to be 10 micrograms typically. In, in uh, um, certain instances, you can get down to one microgram containment levels with continuous liners as well. And the principle is basically, you know, drawing up a, a continuous bag of a polyethylene bag over a cage uh, where you have a sealing mechanism on the bottom of it, which in this case is an inflatable head. You would draw down the, the, the bag, tie the bottom of it up to make a, a basically a closed bottom, stretch it down further, forming a bag, drop your material into it, and then you can do a double crimp and cut so that your material is isolated and removed away while you, again, maintain a closed system on, the, on your process side. The same concept could be used as transferring not just material, but also um, uh, products or parts or tools and, and whatnot in and out of an isolator as well. 
So rather than just flowing material through this, you can actually move objects through it as well. And here, again, what you can have is a, a side port, which uh, typically is a battery adapter, that can also be attached on top of uh, the um, alpha section of an RTP port. And you can provide an endless liner, again, on top of it here. And as you can see, move an object into this area where then you can stretch it out, double crimp and cut, remove it, and again, your process side is sealed off with this double crimp and cut technique. And as I'm talking about double crimp and cut, you know, um, there are other technologies as well, like the heat sealing methodology, oops, sorry, um, which can be utilized. But, you know, uh, there is chances of uh, material getting caught up in here more than the, the double crimp and cut technique. So maybe just looking at that with these special, uh, you know, stack crimping tools that are provided, you can get a fairly tight connection here, which then can be cut between this special clamp that's available, providing you with a very good seal. And then when these are capped off, done in a proper manner, can get you down to, like I said, one microgram containment levels. Um, obviously, you know, we can't get past without talking about glove ports because they're the means of uh, reaching into the isolator and, and uh, handling objects inside of it. Um, there, most of the technologies available are, do provide state change options with them. Some of them are a little bit easier than others, but, um, you know, um, most of them with double O-ring setups on them where you can put a new glove uh, over the old one and push the old one inside of the isolator, providing a, a, a safe change. Um, the size, typical sizes are 8-inch, 10-inch, and 12-inch, and they come in um, round as well as oval design. And, you know, what? My, my experience, I've seen that most people prefer the 10-inch uh, ovals um, when they have the space providing the best possible flexibility in, I guess, uh, restricted spaces that you, you, you have with isolators. Um, HEPA filtration, you know, as we're moving gas in and out of isolators in, in the range of, say, 10 to 20 air changes per, per hour, you know, we have um, single, uh, single HEPA coming in and typically dual HEPA filtration going out of the isolator. Uh, to make sure that the contaminated gas going out um, is, is uh, run through double stages of HEPA filtration. And even so, uh, most of our customers will still direct this output out through a thimble in, into the, uh, to the outside rather than bringing it back into the process room. Um, there's multiple designs available. Here on the left, you're seeing the push-push design, which basically – uh, shows that this this is the uh, area where the isolator wall would be. So this is the inside of the isolator and outside of the isolator. And to change it, you can open up the back of this unit from the technical area, take one of these green cartridges, which is the HEPA filter element, push a new one from the back side in, and as you push that one in, the dirty one on this front end will drop into the isolator, which you can bag out and remove in a, in a clean fashion. Again, showing some additional equipment, like an airlock here, uh, which was made for an isolator mount, and you can see that the, the drive components had to be extended to go through the isolator wall, and which means that it's a special design, again, to make sure that uh, the gearbox and whatnot are not in the uh, process area, uh, causing major headaches for cleaning issues. Similarly, with a butterfly valve here, again, you're seeing an extension to, to remove the actuator to the technical space rather than leaving it in the process zone. And additionally, any gas that's coming into the isolator provided with HEPA filtration to make sure that, you know, you're getting high quality uh, gas coming into your process zone. Um, isolators could be designed in multiple ways. Here I'm showing a single chamber process isolator. This is a, a four inch universal pin mill inside of a single chamber. So the whole process is contained within a single chamber. Obviously it provides economy, but there are some downsides to it. Product collection and filtration is in the same chamber, which means that, you know what, there is some uh, dust particles that can uh, escape the filters and contaminate the internal surfaces, which again is additional cleaning that needs to be done. Uh, similarly, the same four inch universal pin mill can be provided in a multi-chamber design where, you know, the isolator can be broken out into multiple chambers. In this case, uh, the dust collection chamber is a completely isolated area than the milling chamber and even the collection chamber. 
So this design allows for the potentially dirty area, which is the filtration area, to be isolated and, and uh, away from the, the process equipment that has some surfaces that might be difficult to clean and, and just provide smooth walls in here to, to clean easily. Uh, and a third alternative is basically a modular concept where, you know, rather than having an integrated multi-chamber isolator, you can have modular uh, standalone isolators that can be connected to one another to form a modular design. And here, again, you have a, um, a four-inch um, pin universal pin mill in this isolator here, which is your milling isolator. And in this case, the dust collection is in a completely separate unit. And also, there's a cleaning isolator that was requested in this instance where, again, could be formed a modular concept. Um, with isolators, again, uh, integrity of an isolator is very, very critical. As I talked about earlier with the negative pressure, um, you know, we need to make sure that uh, the, the leakage in the isolators are at an uh, acceptable level. Um, so what we like to do is incorporate a, a pressure decay test as part of our startup procedure for most of the isolators that we do. And what it entails is basically pressurizing the chamber um, and looking at the pressure decay or the drop over a given period of time to make sure that the leak rate is acceptable to move forward. Um, if you do come up with leakage, you know, obviously this method does not necessarily provide you with the locations of it. So you could use a tracer gas method where you could pressurize a chamber with um, helium and use a sniffer to find the leaks. But for the most part, as long as your, your decay or the pressure drop level is acceptable, you can move into uh, operating your, your uh, isolator. As I mentioned earlier, the cleaning side is extremely important and it needs to be thought up up front. Um, you know, you can do multi, you know, cleaning in multiple ways. Uh, you know, obviously you can, you can manually dismantle equipment inside the isolator and then remove them wearing PPEs to do uh, remote cleaning. You can, you know, wet them down inside of the isolator so that the dust hazard is minimized and then remove them again with PPEs. Or you can look at, uh, you know, cleaning these in place, what we call wash in place or clean in place. And you can run, you know, uh, solvents through the process as well as the isolator with, um, you know, spray lances. Uh, spray balls that are provided in a sequence uh, that is worked through. Uh, you know, again, use of solvents inside of isolators is not the best potential option due to the fact that, you know, when solvents are atomized, it provides an explosion hazard, which can be circumvented by either inerting the environment or limiting the use of the amount of solvent. So we do recommend potentially using uh, one liter of spray bottles and, you know, spraying and wiping it down this way, minimizing the exposure of gasket material to, to the solvents as well, and also limiting the amount to minimize the, the exposure hazard. Talking about, uh, you know, the gasket material, it is not kind of cr critical, again, tying in the cleaning solvents um, to, the, um, to, to the gasketing material. As you can see here, you know, um, your typical gasketing material, Viton, rubber, nitrogen, neoprene, um, and, and your typical cleaning so solutions here. And you, you have to determine, you know, based on what you, you need to use to, you know, to, to clean your product, uh, what the compatible gasketing material is. And in certain instances, you know, if you're using like THF, you might not have anything but to go with very exotic materials like Teflon or Calrez, which then starts increasing your, um, you know, cost quite drastically. So again, if you look at these up front and, and know what the consequences of, of some of your selections are, you know, you might potentially modify your process. Um, cleaning verification, obviously, is another area that needs to be looked at. You know, uh, once a certain cleaning is done, you know, or your cleaning cycle is completed, you can swap certain areas and do HPLC analysis on them to verify, you know, how clean your isolator is. You can, you, you can do sampling from your uh, rinsing solution that you're collecting uh, to see if, if you know, uh, your, your isolators can be deemed clean, or both of these methodologies can be used together. Um, I'm sure riboflavin is a term that you, you might have heard, and that typically can be um, utilized to uh, verify the coverages of spray balls inside of isolators. You know, to determine your, your cleaning procedures, you know, um, you have to go through, obviously, some trial and error process maybe 
to see how many minutes you're going to run which spray ball inside of the iPhone to get the best cleaning or repeatable cleaning. And you could do that by utilizing the riboflavin solution that's sprayed out, you know, onto surfaces. You would run your uh, spray balls to clean it, and then with a black light, look and see if there's any traces of the riboflavin left inside, which verifies your spray ball coverage within an ice liner. Um, part, again, one of the things that uh, everybody does, obviously, or is looking forward to is the FAT, or making sure that the ice liner that's built meets the requirements of the URS, which the fat rate substance test will show. Um, in addition to that, you know, uh, customers will sometimes require that a containment testing be conducted at our factory, or, you know, this could be done at the customer site as well. Now, to obviously prevent variations, there needed to be a standard established, and, um, you know, SMEPAC, which stands for Standardized Measurement of Equipment Particulate Airborne Concentration, uh, guidelines were first developed, I believe, in about 2005, and I think ISP's Good Practice Guide for Particulate Contamination is now uh, is a new norm that kind of covers the same topic, which tries to standardize on the testing method so that, you know, when I don't test in one way and our customer X does not test in another way, which, uh, which kind of gives you a chance to prove out your process. And this could go into all the details of where the samplers are going to be located, you know, how far away it needs to be located from, let's say, the operator's breathing zone that's working on this unit, down to the airflow of these samplers to, to simulate, let's say, the breathing of an operator by two liters per minute. So all of these being standardized gives you a compatible testing wherever the testing is done. With that, I'll show you guys some slides that, that covers um, some, some different isolators so that you could see what they look like in size and, and whatnot. Here again, you could see a universal mill, which was designed for an R&D application with all the bells and whistles. You know, one of the things I'd like to point out here is a incorporation of an um, inline particle size analyzer that could be utilized with, uh, within the process so that you can look at your particle size of your product coming out of your size reduction equipment. Um, here, i um, showing you a little slightly different setup where a customer was utilizing um, a small size mill, but working with quite large quantities where they were bringing it through a large IBC, docking through a split butterfly valve into the, to, to, into the isolator, but they did not have enough space underneath the dust collection area to, to put the container that they need to, so a pneumatic conveying system was arranged to take that away in a contained manner to bring it to a final um, collection point. Here again, as I mentioned earlier, just with the ancillary equipment like feeders and the HEPA filters and whatnot, even the, the mill that goes into isolators has to be specifically or specially designed to accommodate um, the use inside of an isolator. Here you are seeing a universal mill, a 315 millimeter, uh, which is designed with a whole bunch of hinge arms, again, to make sure that the operator does not have to carry any weight. As you can see, the cover is open, and it's on a hinge arm that just has been kind of moved around. Even the um, tri-clamp connection that is holding the door in place uh, does not kind of fall off, and it's, it's on hinges attached to the back plate, and they open up to a certain point so that the, um, the operator does not have to handle any weight inside of the isolator. And here you can see an, a separate arm to come in and, if need be, remove the, the rotor out of it for, again, cleaning within a contained manner. This one shows slightly different, a uh, food eyes bed jet mill, again, designed for an isolator. This is a 8-inch diameter unit, fairly large unit going into an isolator. Again, making it somewhat heavy and difficult to handle, so it was provided with a, uh, an arm where it allowed you to split and, and rotate the two halves providing um, ease of cleaning um, to the unit. And again, you can see the center uh, tri-clamp connection is attached to the back plane, so that, again, the operator doesn't have to carry or to lift up this weight. Um, one of the things that people kind of uh, look into doing is, since isolator technology is not a very um, cheap or economical um, solution, they like to maximize their bang for the buck, and, and what they do is uh, they, will, they will try to get as much variety inside of one box as possible, meaning providing multiple uh, operations or processes in one isolation system. 
Um, here you can see basically a, an isolator that can handle a jet mill classifier, air classifying mill, spiral jet mill, and a pin mill, um, so that you know one one isolator can handle a multi multitudes of operations. Slightly different unit showing a hammer mill on the bottom area, which the hammer mill actually has been removed to put a four-inch spiral jet mill inside with a collection chamber here. Alternatively, using a eight-inch spiral jet mill. Um, with a dust collection outside of the unit could be utilized, again, giving you um, uh, quite a bit of variety with the same box that you have. A uh, slightly different tack-off isolator, uh, showing that um, nanogram containments can be achieved discharging from whatever you have up upstream. In this case, it was a new dryer, uh, filling into containers through a uh, continuous liner in a contained manner. And here you're seeing some CIP attachments that were also designed um, reactor charging isolator, uh, filling dispensing isolators, drum tipping isolators, again, a variety of things that can be done, and you're seeing roughly the size and complexities associated with them. Here, uh, a customer requested screening to be done inside of an isolation with a dual chamber setup where, you know, drum of material was docked to the back side, brought in here, dumped it through a screening deck, and, and split up into uh, two, two uh, separate separated uh, particle ranges. Um, and, a, and a tray drying isolator, which a, a um, rigid wool isolator was actually attached in front of a tray dryer to give you uh, contained access to the dried pile powder um, that's being removed from the, the uh, tray dryer. With that, um, you know, just, uh, this brings us to the conclusion of the presentation, and I'd just like to reiterate um, uh, the, the planning that's required in designing systems uh, of this nature. Um, again, identify what is really required, and, you know, you can go overboard, but to understand that it's going to come at a very high cost. A comprehensive URS, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, gives you this capability. And obviously, do not forget about the CIP side of things, uh, since that's a, a major, major uh, source of problems downstream. And again, this concludes our presentation on the basics of high containment. Uh, I hope you found this uh, the, the presentation informative, and uh, we thank you for your participation. With that, I think what we'll do is we'll take some questions, um, although I think I'm running a little bit late, but we'll take a few questions, and, and whatever I can't get to now, we'll try to answer them offline. Um, I see here a question that says, uh, what is the um, typical surrogate material for uh, for testing? Um, you know what, there's different types of materials that could be used, uh, lactose uh, it being one of the primary ones, uh, sodium naproxen could be used, uh, riboflavin, mannitol, sucrose, acetaminophen, um, so these are different alternatives. Again, some of the reasons why you would pick one or the other is, like, let's say with sodium naproxen, you can you can get detection down to about 0.5 nanograms. So, or compared to a lactose of two nanogram uh, detection level, so that could be a reason for selecting one of, over the other. Um, uh, does the mock-up have to be done at factory? Um, you know what, the, the mock-up can be done, or, or we, you know, obviously from a standpoint of modifications, we prefer doing it at the factory, which gives us, uh, depending upon if it's a one-day, two-day mock-up, um, and if we decide on a minor change, we can then quickly modify it and test it out if it's done at factory. But alternatively, we have shipped, uh, you know, uh, mock-ups to job sites where obviously it enables a multitude of operators um, to, to utilize them. I, we understand that it's not easy to, you know, bring 10 operators to, to our factory. So, you know, shipping it out to your facility does provide you that, that advantage. And, yes, it is doable. Um, there's another question. Um, do isolators have to be secured in their location, or can they be mobile? Um, I guess, you know, I showed a, quite a variety of different size isolators, and, you know, the, the smallest, the FCI being a fairly small isolator, uh, certainly can be put on wheels and moved around um, versus some of the large isolators could weigh up to a couple of tons, two, three tons. So, yes, even though they're three tons, they can be put on wheels, uh, but it's not going to be very easy to move them around. 
Um, additionally, I, I would I would stress the fact that, as I pointed out with the integrity testing section, um, that you know the seals on the doors of the ice feeders are fairly critical from a leakage standpoint. So moving these, especially isolators with bigger doors on, moving them around is not very recommended. You know, if you go over bumps and whatnot, you 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 have a chance of of damaging um, the the seals and potentially causing higher leak rates. Um, another question: um, Have you provided contained product collectors? Oh, I showed some some isolators with I guess containment in them. Um, and, and maybe to clarify, I'm not really sure what the, uh, the exact nature of the question is, but maybe to clarify, uh, we can provide, uh, we have a patented um, reverse pulse uh, product collection system that's capable of handling four bags inside of it. And again, there's a limit to four bags because of reach for these bags to, to remove it and clean it. Uh, bigger than this, you're going into uh, large size air volumes, um, in, in those cases, we recommend using standard bag houses with uh, bag in, bag out adapters, or possibly going into um, a centered metal elements that can provide you with uh, CIP or SIP capability. Um, And I think what I'll do is I'll take one more question for the time being. Um, it says here, um, you, the double screw feeder that, that's uh, shown in the presentation, um, you know, who's the manufacturer and um, can it be sterilized? Um, the, the twin screw feeder that I showed, actually all the feeders that I showed, are made by Hosokawa. And, and the twin screw feeder in particular, um, it can be um, sterilized, so it, it is provided as a sterilizable version. The only thing is we cannot provide it as an SIP design uh, with, in a gravimetric form within an isolator. So if it's in an isolator, it can be sterilizable, but in only in a volumetric mode. I think with that, uh, we've kind of come to the end of our, um, of our time frame here. Um, I will I will end the presentation here, and there are a few more questions that what I'll do is I'll answer offline um, uh, to to the individuals. I just want to remind you again about the survey that we're going to send out. We we do appreciate your response to it. It, it only helps us to improve our presentations. And again, there will be a drawing for a fifty dollar American uh, Express gift certificate. Thank you.